Okay, everybody, welcome back to the final session of WordCamp London 2018. Our final speaker of the day is the founder and director of Pragmatic, a WordPress specialist agency. He's passionate about blockchain and make, wants to make sure that we're as ready as we can be as a community for what's coming in regards to blockchain. Please welcome David. Thanks. Hi. Can you hear me? Is the speaker on? Yeah? Cool. I was just slacking my team, asking where they are, because I expected them to be here. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I'm going to talk about um, WordPress and blockchain. Uh, blockchain is something I've gotten pretty deeply into over the last year, kind of taken the red pill on it a little bit, fallen down the rabbit hole, and I want to share some of the things that I think are going on and will be interesting. Sorry. Okay. So I'm going to cover um, a little bit of history, like what, what, um, why is blockchain interesting and important right now. I'll run through some terminology so that you understand what I'm talking about later on. We'll look at some key advantages of blockchain. We'll look at some... Um, some of the projects that are out there, how they might represent a threat or an opportunity, and um, a few things about where I think this might go and what you can do to prepare for that future, if you believe me when I say it's coming. So to talk about blockchain, really we have to start with trust. And because um, that's really the, the thing that blockchain addresses. It's like an infrastructure for trust. So I'm going to give you a little brief potted history of the way that I see trust. And um, we'll go from there. So when we were, I'm a zoologist, so I believe in evolution. And uh, when we lived in our sort of ancestral hominid state of tribes running around, we had to trust each other. And we could trust each other because we were all interrelated. Um, so in the group, we trusted each other. Outside the, the group, we knew we couldn't trust people. Um, as we became agricultural, we needed to have sort of specialized skills. So you had to have a farmer. You had to have somebody to make shoes, make tools. And you had to have a medium of exchange, um, which was some sort of rudimentary currency, which is often actually food itself, but later coins and um, other kind of more durable items. As those towns grew into cities, we needed whole organizations to help, uh, to, to trust, to keep the peace. So we had to have police to make sure that we um, didn't all rob each other, and governments to make sure that everyone knew what the rules were and knew what taxes were expected, etc. As we've kind of developed into this global, um, global society, those institutions have become ever more complex and ever more uh, important. And now we've got things like the EU and Interpol and all those sorts of things. Um, and digital really so far has just been kind of an extension of that, right? So. Um, when I want a passport, previously I'd have applied to the, written a letter to the UK government, and now I might apply online, right? Or um, if I, in a previous life, I would have trusted a, like, a bank with my money, I'd have gone to the bank, paid them the money, gone to the counter, got it back out. Now we can do that online, but it's really the same thing. It's just digitized. It's easier, it's more convenient, and it's faster. And everything up to this point in the story has been about centralized authority, right? So it's kind of giving more and more power to governments, institutions, universities, etc. cetera. Um, and what blockchain does is it says, you don't have to trust anyone. And in fact, that you can't trust anyone. And so it builds this trustless network, which in a kind of weird and ironic way, means that you can trust everyone. Because if we start from the basis that you can't trust anyone and we build around that and assume that we can't trust anyone, as soon as you build in a, an infrastructure for trust, then it changes the world. And that's really what blockchain's about. It's an infrastructure for a new economy where it doesn't matter about who we trust and who we don't 
trust. It doesn't matter about having a central authority for anything. It means that we can collaborate at large scale safely, um, bound by the maths, bound by the cryptography that secures the network of the blockchain. And this is important because right now we live in very untrusting times. So even before the Facebook, Trump, Brexit, Cambridge Analytica thing, there was Equifax. And before that, there was the uh, office of uh, the personnel office in the States that leaked uh, or, or was hacked for a whole bunch of information. So we've kind of found ourselves in this world where we've had to trust the centralized sort of authority figures. So Facebook with our data, Equifax with our credit record, government with our identity. And yet, almost every week or every month, it seems like we really can't trust them because people are people and they screw up or they're targets for hackers or, or whatever it is. So people now live in this sort of very dystopian world where more and more we need to trust computers and the data because that's the only way that we can be efficient with our lives and keep up with the modern economy. But actually, in a centralised kind of paradigm, it's really difficult to do that, as is proven time and time again by different abusers. So we need to re-engineer trust. We need to fix that. And our job is sort of, most of us probably get paid out of a digital marketing budget, right? So marketing directors, CMOs, they're the ones that hold the budget to pay for websites. And it's our job to support them as marketers to build these deep relationships with their customers, um, whether those are consumers or whether there are other businesses. And so it's this, um, this idea of how do we build trust around organizations, around companies, around purposes that I find so compelling about blockchain. So, here's a bit of jargon. Um, I'm going to start off with a quick definition of blockchain itself, which I only found out about this week, so I'm going to have to read it, I'm afraid. It is the Harry Potter definition of trust, of uh, blockchain, which is actually pretty useful. Sorry, I'm going to read it on here. Okay, so a blockchain is exactly what it says on the tin. It's a chain of blocks. Each block tells a story, and when placed in order with all the other blocks in the chain, they tell you the entire life story of the blockchain. Uh, every transaction ever or every uh, contract that's ever been executed. If you try and change a block, then the story stops making sense, and the fans, which in the case of the blockchain are the nodes, will notice, and they'll be cross about it, and they won't let you get away with it. So if you can imagine ripping a few pages out of somebody's Harry Potter book, they're going to get across, they're going to know that that's not right. If you try and change the order of the books, you try and change the story at all, there are now so many Harry Potter fans in the world, there's no way that you could get away with even changing a sentence, probably, without getting caught out. And that's really the essence of the blockchain. It's something that's immutable, that everyone can see, and there's a consensus around. So... Um, Like geeking out a little bit on this, we're used to hashes within technology, right? We're all technologists. When you git commit, you get a hash of that change set. And that's what um, blockchain is built off, these hashes. And they get bundled together in blocks. The network confirms exactly what is in each of those blocks. And then they form an immutable chain because each block references the one before it, and so on. So there's no way you could ever change a piece of history in that whole blockchain without it being super obvious, right? So it becomes a single, totally immutable, transparent uh, source of truth, which is actually quite an interesting and um, important thing when you think about the implications. So there are some other important um, terms. A consensus algorithm is uh, how does the network agree what's in those blocks, and there's this um, sort of one of the things that the white paper from about Bitcoin uh, explained was how to solve the Byzantine generals problem, which is basically if you've got a city in the middle and you've got your generals all the way around the outside, the only way that you can conquer the city is if they all attack at the same time um, and they all attack. But the thing is you can't trust the generals, you can't trust the intermediaries, 
between the generals, and if only some of you attack, then you probably fail and your army will be destroyed, right? So how do you solve that problem where you've got all these interconnected nodes that you can't trust? How do you make them build consensus? So it's like a really interesting piece of maths. So once you've got that, you've got this decentralized ledger, which is basic. So ledger is like a database, right? So if you're a bank, it says money was sent from this person to that person on this date and back from this person to that person on that date. That's ledger with a blockchain everyone can have a full copy of the whole ledger. So it'd be like everyone having a copy of the whole financial systems record so that everyone could tell if anything was ever changed, right? So on top of that kind of decentralized ledger, you've got the consensus algorithm, which helps people understand, uh, agree what goes in there. And you've got this technology called smart contracts, which are essentially programmable agreements that run when certain conditions are met. So you might say, Remkus, let's bet an Ethereum each that tomorrow the weather in San Diego will be 28 degrees. Um, and you might say, no, it's going to be hotter. And I'll say, right, it's going to be on it or cooler. So we can choose an oracle. We might say like MSN weather. If you say th this API, API endpoint says 28 or higher, then you win. And if it's 27 or lower, then I win. And um, we both put our Ethereums into that smart contract. And on that time, on that date, it checks the API. The value it gets back determines what happens. And at that point, once you've put that contract on the Ethereum blockchain, it will execute. There's no way of uh, taking it back, right? So it's a way that we can bet with each other without needing to trust uh, Jacobo here to hold our Ethereums and decide who is the winner. So it's like a peer-to-peer -peer contract. The most popular... Cryptocurrency is Bitcoin. Everyone's heard about that. There are actually like a ton of them now. Um, so cryptocurrencies are uh, like a digital asset that have their own blockchain. Um, coins and tokens are, they don't necessarily always have their own blockchain, but they do the same thing. So they represent either something that's like an inherit, inherently digital asset, or it could be like a manifestation of a physical asset. So you could say, right, here's a Bitcoin. It doesn't mean anything in the real world. That's a coin. Likewise, you could say, right, we're going to divide the, the deeds to this building into a thousand small pieces. They're going to be represented by a thousand tokens, and we can all own like a thousandth of this building each. Both of those things would be valid things to do with uh, like a crypto asset. So oracles are those things that we talked about in the case of Remkus and I's bet. It was uh, MSN's weather service. It could be something else entirely, but it's basically a trusted third party who, uh, who can inform a smart contract of what's happening. Um, there's a lot to take in with this stuff. Now imagine that this blockchain is less like just a decentralized ledger, and it's actually like a whole virtual computer, because that's what... Ethereum, which is the second biggest cryptocurrency and blockchain project, is. So uh, all of the computers running all of the Ethereum nodes all around the world essentially form the Ethereum virtual machine. And that's what lets you run smart contracts and do other things. Like, I don't know if anyone heard about CryptoKitties. CryptoKitties is a decentralized application. So I have applications on my laptop, on my smartphone, you can also create an application that runs on the Ethereum virtual machine. So it's a program that runs out there in this decentralized network. It runs on no one's computer and everyone's. So if you're running a node, it'll run. Um, so it's like an extremely resilient way of running an application. It runs across that whole thing. So Bitcoin is now the most powerful computing network that's ever been in the world. So if you're running an application on that network, you're running the most resilient application that you could run. Digital app, uh, decentralized apps, dApps are super interesting. Um, and then crypto economics, like what does all this mean? How does it change people's behavior? How does it um, change the way that we can work together, work with machines, collaborate? That's what crypto economics is. What does all this add up to mean for human behavior? Are you kind of with me so far? Yeah? Going too fast? No? Any questions? Okay. 
So what it kind of means is this, which is um, a delightfully Swiss-German word, which basically means self-responsibility. And in Switzerland, they have this concept where as long as you're contributing back and being a good citizen, you're welcome and everyone leaves you alone. As soon as you stop, uh, unless you're a Swiss citizen, you get booted out of the country, right? And it's this, this idea that with blockchain, it lets us all be responsible for ourselves. In fact, it kind of gives us that power. There's no kind of um, hiding and pretending that problems in the world are somebody else's, right? It allows all of us to collaborate and tackle any problem that we think is important to us personally. So it's this incredible platform for mass collaboration. Um, anyway, I just think it's a nice word. Uh, these are some of the key advantages. So we've talked about it being decentralized. So I could be running a Bitcoin node on my laptop here. You could be running them on there. They could be running in data centers. Um, there are hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of Bitcoin nodes running. So every single copy, uh, every single node has a full copy of the ledger. So even if you took out the whole of the USA or the whole of China, the Bitcoin network would still be running, right? It's incredibly decentralized. There's no central like Bitcoin master node. Every node is equal. Um, very powerful concept. The Bitcoin blockchain is entirely transparent. So you can go back in time and see every single transaction that's ever happened. Um, so people think it's like something that criminals use to buy drugs. Actually, that's a really stupid thing to do because it's like super transparent and you can now figure out like they've got kind of a blockchain analysis tools and they can pretty much figure out who you are. So there are other good cryptocurrencies for buying <laughs> drugs online. Bitcoin's not one because it's a transparent blockchain. Um, fast, efficient transactions. Now, this is relative. So at the moment, if I want to transfer the deeds from my house, like the, like the title deeds for some land that I own, that's typically a process that takes weeks, involves lawyers and surveyors and costs lots of money and takes lots of time. If that's a digital asset, it's literally a case of me, you and me agreeing a transaction putting it into the blockchain, once that, tra once that uh, transaction is locked in the blockchain, you now own that deed. You know, so that could be five minutes. So if it's a digitized asset, it means that we can transfer that value around super quickly. So there's a, um, there's a cryptocurrency blockchain project called Ripple, who work with a lot of banks. And their mission, which is a really nice way to think about this kind of uh, fast, efficient transaction thing is to make, um, like if the, the web so far has been about uh, transferring information, right? So their mission is to make it as easy to transfer value as it is information, which is a really powerful concept if you think about it. Uh, because it's decentralized, um, it's incredibly stable. You can always access the data that's in the blockchain. You can always access the system itself, even if there's one node running. All that data is there. It's still, it's still there for you. So it's the most resilient thing that we've ever built. Um, and because you can't change that data, there's no chance of data corruption. Um, so you always know that this thing that you save to the blockchain is always going to be there forever, as long as that blockchain is up. Okay. So here's an example of what happens when you can see every single transaction that ever happened. This is um, a transaction recorded on the Bitcoin blockchain, which you can see if you go to that web address. That shows you which wallet sent what amount to which wallet and any other information they put into that transaction. What they did was send 10,000 Bitcoins to their local pizza place in return for two pizzas. And uh, one of my favorite things on the internet is the Bitcoin pizza Twitter account where every day it reminds you just how much those pizzas are now worth. So a, few we yeah, a week or so ago, worth $92 million, <clears throat> which is kind of cool. Um, OK, so on to the WordPress side of things. What's coming down the road and going to smack us in the mouth while we're all worrying about Gutenberg and GDPR? Um, platforms, 
developers, ecosystem, and governance. So I think unless we sort some of these things out and like move, like do what we do anyway, which is like move, adapt, learn, unless we tackle some of these, we're going to lose our kind of, um, you know, lose some traction, lose some market share. These are like clear and present threats. And I hope you'll agree when I run through them as to why. So here's an example of a platform. This one's called Steemit. It's basically like a Reddit or a Medium. Instead of earning gold or claps, you earn Steam dollars. You can then take your Steam dollars to an exchange and walk out with real dollars and go and buy your groceries. So it's a way of getting direct reader revenue from your readership. There's no ads. There's no contract with a publisher. There's nothing like that. So you know when you like something on Facebook or give somebody an upvote on Reddit, that becomes a currency which is worth some actual money. So it's a very powerful concept. And that's reflected by Steam at success. It's actually a super horrible editing experience. It's worse than the current WordPress editor by a long way. I don't think you can even store media on Steam it. But it's now within the top 1,000 sites in the world. And it's only been around for a couple of years. So it's like they're killing it because people are like, People's mindset is, what's in it for me, right? I mean, we're selfish biological creatures most of the time. And if I can post on WordPress.com and get a couple of likes, or I can post it on Steemit and pay for my groceries, what am I going to do? I'm going to post it on Steemit. You know, that's a real threat that we have to find a way to let people earn money by posting content on WordPress. This one is really interesting, Civil. So this is a decentralized application built on the Ethereum blockchain, which is interesting in itself. So it's like a CMS for what, what's a, like a newsroom application that's built as a decentralized application. It's built to solve very specific problems that publishers have right now, particularly journalists. So they don't want to necessarily be bound to contracts, they don't want to have ads on the site, they don't want to be tied to affiliate marketing or some crap like that. What they want is to be able to get paid by their readers for producing quality content. So they have their underlying uh, token which lets that happen. You can read a post on Civil when it opens and you can transfer some tokens that they can then go and trade out and buy their groceries with or pay their runners or whatever journalists do. Um, but the use of the tokens that underpin the platform go much deeper. So by holding the tokens, it gives you a say in the governance of what happens with the project. So uh, the more tokens you hold, the more votes that you have about things like, should we add this feature or that? Should we nominate this project lead or that? So it goes right through to the governance of the whole ecosystem for this, for this platform. Uh, third party developers who can build apps to sit on top of Civil can get tokens, they can earn tokens as well. So it's a way for developers to earn revenue directly for building uh, and contributing to open source marketplaces. And this one, the last one, who knows what a token curated registry is? Because I certainly didn't. Um, But it's fascinating. So what happens is when you sign up to be a newsroom on Civil, you pledge to adhere to certain codes of conduct, like no plagiarism, no uh, fake news, no hate speech, etc. And the way that you uh, guarantee your, like you put a bond up for good behavior is that you put a stake up of these tokens, right? So if you're serious about running a newsroom, you might put up like £10,000 worth of civil tokens, and then that acts as a bounty for people to come and fact check you. And if you get called out, that person has to challenge you with some of their tokens, and depending <coughs> who is found to be in the right, they get the tokens, right? So it's like a bond for good behavior, and a stake of me saying, right, I intend to be reputable, and here's my proof. Here are my tokens, take them off me if you can. So it's a very, interesting, powerful way of thinking about what does, what does a tokenized economy look like. But moreover, 
Civil has looked exactly at what journalists need and they've built a platform to fix those very specific problems. Okay, so these are just content. These are things that I think are going to take some of WordPress market share if we don't, uh, don't watch out. And that's just the, a few that I've found. Um, there's a link here to this. So this is the like a Web 2 to Web 3 comparison chart. There's another one for the uh, blockchain-based marketing technology landscape. Um, if nothing else, and this includes like financial services and ticketing and a whole bunch of stuff. It's not just web stuff, but there is a serious amount of effort going on in this space to build out things which are economically deeply challenging to the way that things are at the moment. So it's, it's way beyond Bitcoin. Okay, so developers. Let's talk about developers. This one's particularly bothersome for me, being somebody who tries to hire and keep developers. So in the top right, we see this guy, Mike Dudas. You see he's worked before at Braintree, Venmo, Google, PayPal, Disney. He's now working on a blockchain project. The number of times I see this, like people working at the most cutting-edge software companies in the world are now doing a blockchain project, is like it's more than just coincidence. There's a trend going on. And the reason is blockchain developers are like hen's teeth at the moment, right? There are something... Something like 14 or 18, I saw on a stat on the side, a slide recently, 14 or 18 times more openings than there are developers. So WordPress is quite a contended space, right? So we're, like, unless you're lucky to be at the top and a premium, then you're basically competing with often Indian or like Eastern European developer right, rates. Here, developers are like they're charging at least double what WordPress developers are charging. And you know what? The work, the work that they're doing is, I'd say, it's more interesting and important as well. And that's me running an agency. Um, being, being honest, you know, I really do think it's true. I mean, blockchain development is harder as well. The, there are more languages. The consequences of screwing up are, are worse. Like, imagine losing $300 million or something like that. I mean, it's like not low stress. But um, I've just come back from Silicon Valley and the amount of activity and like insanely clever people working in this space is mind-blowing. It really is. So don't underestimate how attractive this new space is going to be. If you can code, then you can help build a new economy, which is at least as exciting as building a WordPress site. Um, so, there's a new ecosystem that's going on out there as well. It's not just about the platforms. It's not just about the development. It's about this whole... It's about the whole concept of what it means to have content, to have an application, to run software. It's a whole new way of thinking economically and about collaborating. So there are going to be new solutions to problems for which currently WordPress is a good option. And th so there's that kind of high level, just ecosystem and approach and theoretical threat th that's lurking out there. This one, I feel a little bit nervous about putting up there because I don't want to offend anyone that is involved with the WordPress project or anyone that works so hard to lead it in a good, honest, responsible way. But I think WordPress project governance is honestly confusing for some users. You know, this is a conversation that I've had to have. You know, we're running WordPress, but it's also kind of connected to WordPress.com, which is kind of like WordPress, but it's not because it's owned by this centralized business. And then to make use of your features, we have to connect you through Jetpack, which is this thing that's run by automatic, but it comes with, and it gets like super confusing, even for me, um, and quite untenable for enterprises who need to know who's got any kind of access to their site, right? You know, the new versions of WooCommerce all ship with these great features, but you have to be connected to WordPress.com's infrastructure to do it, right? 
and that's a point of entry, and it's a centralized point of entry, which I'll talk about as well. Um, so WordPress.org is a piece of community-owned software. It's um, you know, run by the foundation, etc. I think there's a new breed of projects with new ways of governance coming, and I think we have to seriously consider what are the structures and mechanisms by which WordPress is going to be managed going forward, you know, because people are going to come to expect this sort of transparency about decision-making and influence. That's my two cents on that one. So what about all the good stuff? Now I've sowed doom and gloom. <laughs> well, the good news is that the WordPress community is, until, 10 minutes, crap. Okay, um, the WordPress community is full of exceptional individuals who have worked together to produce one of the most important software projects that's ever been. We continually learn and adapt and I think that the WordPress community can achieve so much more by looking at what's out there and figuring out like, how do we adopt, how do we pivot, how do we absorb, how do we integrate. That's what WordPress does, right? You know, plugins are what makes WordPress work and there are opportunities out there. But we have to, we have to start looking now and start thinking now and start developing now because they're coming thick and fast. So here's some good ideas that I think are good ideas. Anyway, so let's fix broken stuff. Who read the post by the guy that spent like five years uh, chasing debt, like running a spam comment plugin, and he had a breakdown because he ended up looking at like people dying and really horrible things happening the whole time? Like a super horrible problem, right? And um, so comment spam, email spam, review spam, th these are all problems that can get fixed by the same principles as, um, as the civil idea, right? So you have to put a stake up or you have to pay like a microtransaction, right? So what if it costs you um, one penny, one cent to leave uh, like a, a comment on a WordPress blog, right? You know, the, the economics of spam are screwed up. You have to send billions of emails to make like 10,000 bucks back. So what if you put a tiny cost on each of those transactions? It blows spam out of the water. And there are platforms out there doing that. They do. CoinHive has like a little Monero miner. Monero is a cryptocurrency. So instead of telling Google which pictures have storefronts in, you just let your browser run some hashing for two seconds. And that is, if you've got a server farm, now uneconomic uneconomic to leave all this comment spam. Uh, there's BitBounce for email, and there's another one as well. I can't remember, earn.com, I think. So you can set up an account now on earn.com, set your price, send me an email, that's how much it's going to cost you. Um, security and infrastructure. So uh, Matt Radford pointed this one out on Twitter yesterday, which I think is a doozy. Um, so this ticket is about... It basically says, currently, if an attacker can compromise api.wordpress.org, then they can gain access to every single WordPress install on the planet. Now, Automatic's team do a very good job of securing the wordpress.com infrastructure, and so does the core team securing the .org infrastructure. Nevertheless, it is a centralized infrastructure and a centralized entry point to a massive surface area of the web. So it's a huge risk. So what if we stored software updates and their hashes on the blockchain? What if every time your software, your WordPress site tried to update WordPress or a plugin or a theme, it looked for consensus, it looked for the hashes, and wouldn't allow an installation to proceed unless this blockchain was in consensus, that this was valid software and the hash matched? Wouldn't that be a more secure way of doing it than having centralized infrastructure? I think it would be. There's opportunities for new integrations. So this is an excellent project. It's called Basic Attention Token, which takes the idea of tokenizing stuff to a really cool degree, which is they tokenize a unit of human attention. So this is a project by the guy that created JavaScript. He worked in Mozilla. 
So he's no fool. Um, and it basically says, like Civil, you can directly reward publishers by transferring tokens, but it also does a bunch of stuff around advertising and stopping this kind of weird power that advertisers seem to have over everyone in the digital marketing space. So I would definitely recommend checking out that project. Um, but the point here is we'll be able to charge clients for doing different types of integrations than we think about doing at the moment. This one is like uncannily, validly close to WordPress, right? It's called Poet. It's got something about Gutenberg on the home page. It's a really cool project. What it does, every time you post some content, it puts that content on the blockchain and it creates a transaction that proves that this content was posted by this person on this time, here's the hash of it. So it then becomes proof of ownership, right? That's my copyright. Um, there's a WordPress plugin for it already, which is great. But imagine now there's a service where you post content, it gets like the proof of authorship is locked into the blockchain and there's like a crawler that goes out online, it finds somebody that's pinched your content and automatically issues a takedown notice or offers them a license thing. You know, there's, there's such smarter ways that we can do stuff with content ownership now. Um, and this is a live thing, like you can literally use this service now. This one is cool as well, so I'm going to do that thing that you should never do, which is to do a video in a talk. So, this is Starblocks, and these are the coffees that you can buy. And this is showing a cryptocurrency checkout for an e-commerce thing, right? So, that's what's happening. You don't really need the audio for this. So they've got a drink, it costs 0 0.6, 0 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, Bitcoin. It's giving you a QR code on the thing. You're opening up your wallet app. This person's then gonna do like an absolutely god awful job of trying to get the QR, scan, QR code scanned. But like this is not adding, taking cards out of pockets. This is not putting credit card numbers in. This is an app on a phone with a wallet in it talking to a wallet on a merchant's account. It's picked up their address and the amount that he wants to pay, that person wants to pay, click, done. That's the future of e-commerce, right? It's just so much, it's so obviously so much better than logging into PayPal or copy and pasting credit card numbers in. Like, just so obviously. And that's the thing to remember about cryptocurrency is it's a nat digitally native way of transacting value. It's not old methods bolted onto a new medium. It's, it's natively digital. So if you imagine there's like TCIP, IP, SMTP, DNS, TLS. Yeah, I'm not going to hit that. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> then... You know, what we don't have is like a protocol for sending money, right? Do you know there's even an HTTP code for payment required? It's like a 4, 402, I think, payment required. But we never built a protocol to actually send the money for it. So even from the beginning of the internet, the very first web had this idea of like <coughs> paying for content. This is that protocol, cryptocurrency. Uh, some other minor stuff, so imagine that you as an author have your public address on the thing and your social graph of what you've posted, proof of ownership, certifications, affiliations, accreditations are all mapped through this open transparent network. What does that mean for SEO? It's like the world's richest graph. You know, how do you determine relevance when it's not just about keywords and keyword relationships? Imagine a social graph, the power of Facebooks for the whole web. Um, maybe without Facebook. Uh, <laughs> so what new services can you offer as an agency? You know, I think one thing that I feel passionately is that I don't know why we charge so little for what we do. Like, we as a business charge the same daily rate as a plumber. That's not cool. 
Like we add strategic value and help businesses transform, stay alive, and create impact. Like why on earth do web agencies only get to charge 100 quid an hour or whatever it is? You know, it's insane. You go to Anderson, like uh, Accenture or IBM or somebody like that, you know, they like 10x those prices. And I think this is our opportunity to do that. It's our opportunity to say, look, here's the value that we're creating because that's the money that's in your wallet that wasn't there before. You know, this is a brave new world. And we, as A, technologists, and B, people that are used to working in an open source community and creating value and working through agile backlogs and delivering, delivering tickets, we can transform the economy. This is our opportunity to triple our rates, pay our developers double, have a much bigger impact on the world. So we're going to need to learn as businesses how to do some of that stuff. But it's there for the taking. And this is why. Because everyone's heard a joke about like a DIY or a vegan and a CrossFit are walking into a bar and like who says what they are first, something like that, right? So the, the internet has created this like this fabric of micro communities of people that have causes and passions and believe in stuff. You know, it can be hyper niche, like you know, knitwear for cats. But there's enough people online that you can build a community around that, right? And if you can build a community, you can build an economy now because you can create a token, you can transfer it, and you can create these circular values of one minute. No, no, I, I might actually make it. Um, <laughs> Circular economies of value. So it might be that you never trade a CrossFit coin outside of, you know, a weird shoe company, a paleo diet company in your CrossFit gym, but it doesn't matter, right? You know, if that's, if that's the way that you want to transact as a community, you can. And so brands, this is like zooming way out, but the organizations and the brands of the future are going to be very different from what they are now. You know, it's going to be about closer alignment with human values. What, what do we want to achieve? What impact do we want to have in the world? What's our plan for doing it? And how can we work together to make it happen, right? What are, what are the economics behind this change that we want to see? Um, so I think there's going to be an Uber coin. Those guys shift in like, I know time is definitely up. Those guys shift like tens of millions around the world every day to deal with different payments coming and going to different drivers in different countries. They would kill for a cryptocurrency that they could do that like that with. Just a fact. And as soon as the US regulators sort out what they want to do with this, then we'll see that happening. Um, I don't even have time for, to go into this stuff, but it's like everything's going to change and read up about it. <laughs> Summarize that one. Um, there are some things that you can do. So basic attention token runs in this browser called Brave at the moment. At some point, they'll build like a Chrome plugin. Download it, have a look at the settings, see what's different from normal like web browser settings. Think about, think about implementing it on your own site. Think about using some of these platforms. Try them out, see how they work, see how comfortable they feel to us technologists that are used to working in this space. Um, like, learn about this technology, because it is absolutely coming. I promise you that. Like, forget about the news about Bitcoin going up or down. Like, that is just, it's just a distraction. Uh, yeah, what features do they, you know, I showed that whole list of plugins. <laughs> <laughs> it's not financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. Talk to a financial advisor or a lawyer. That's not financial advice. <laughs> That was subtle, Hannah. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. I'm sorry for rushing you there no, at no, the no. end, but we have to get on to the next thing. It was really fascinating, and I'm sorry we don't have time for questions. Will you be around after the closing, uh, closing remarks so people can?